Hey, welcome back TCS TV viewers. Chris Nichols here from the camera store. And uh, we are in New York, of course. As you can see, this is not Calgary. We're here for a big Sony event, which we're really excited about. But today, I've actually got something I'm also incredibly excited about, which is a new unsung cameras of yesteryear. And today, we're looking at the Sony DSC R1. Now, our unsung cameras of yesteryear are a segment where we take a look at cameras that you know, existed in the past that maybe didn't sell very well or didn't get a lot of press, but in a lot of ways were actually really exciting cameras. And in digital terms, old is exactly what this camera is. And we're talking 12 years. In the digital era, that's a big deal. I was at the camera store, I was actually having my first child. And uh, it shocks me because a lot of the staff that we have working in the store now were probably in their single digits as far as age goes. But the DSC R1 was something that's really innovative. And I mean, innovation is really one of the reasons that we're here with Sony today. They've become a huge leader in the camera industry, and that's because they innovate a lot of their products. And some have been misses. This camera never really sold well, but this is the first APS-C camera that they stuck behind a beautiful 24 to 120 lens. This is really the precursor for the mirrorless industry that we enjoy today. And so, I really want to play with this camera, take it around the streets of New York, give it a try, and let's just look at what's really changed. Now, one of the things that people really didn't like about the R1 was this whole LCD screen setup. Now, it does fully swivel and rotate, but it's positioned on the top of the camera. Now, it actually was very decent for its time. It was a two inch screen, 134,000 dots, which I know by today's standard is nothing, but it's actually quite usable. Uh, looks sharp enough considering the size. You gotta remember a lot of SLRs at the time were rocking one and a half inch screens. So this was a big deal. The thing is that when you've got it up like this for the back of the camera, you really have to have it sticking straight up. And I think that attracts attention. It makes the camera larger than you might want it to be. You worry about things getting broken off and stuff like that. So you can slap it down and look at it like a top view uh, kind of thing. And as a waist level, it works excellent. Now the other thing too is we've got a selector switch here between the finder or the LCD or an automatic sensor. The only complaint there, I mean bringing it up it works great, it goes right to my eye, clicks on, but when I bring it down to my waist to look at it, if I get too close to my clothing, it turns it off because it thinks it's an eye. Once you get used to that, I suppose it is pretty functional. So I'm trying to get some macro shots here. Without image stabilization, I got my ISO up to 800, I'm shooting 60th, so I'm going to take a bunch in hopes I can get something sharp. But one thing that does really help is actually the shutter mechanism. This is a leaf shutter up to 2,000th of a second maximum. And of course, there's just no shape. There's no slap, there's no movement. And especially when the R1 came out being effectively a mirrorless camera, that made a big difference compared to its APS-C DSLR counterparts. Now on top of that, I can also make it basically silent. I've got a beep, I've got a digital shutter noise, or I can turn it completely off. And that's nice when you want to keep things nice and quiet and discreet. So one thing I'm finding with the shutter mechanism here in the startup time, actually very impressive. The DSC R1 starts up, I'd say in about a second. Frankly, by the time I get the camera up to my eye, it is ready to go, no problem. So I never feel like I'm gonna miss the shot. And I was surprised because I expected to. One thing about the shutter though, it's a very soft touch. It's not a half press. I mean, basically you brush this thing, it auto focuses. If you push too hard, you're totally gonna get a shot before you want it. Gordon Lang hey, from Cameralabs.com. Yeah, how are you doing? What a massive coincidence. <laughs> yeah, what can we possibly be here for at the same time? <laughs> I think you look quite nice with like a pink green mix. Blue would maybe be a little bit harsh with your skin tone. My dentist, I went in there recently and uh, they gave me an appointment at 2.40. Right. Well, who resists a chance to have an appointment at 2.30? 
Well, Gordon, after that uh, very not contrived intro, let's, uh, let's talk about this camera because this is interesting. I talked about how I first used this camera at the store in 2005, but you actually reviewed this camera mm. on Cameralabs.com, didn't you? Yeah, well, I was just launching Cameralabs at the time. It was the end of 2005. You've got it all ready, poised to go onto the, <laughs> into the scene. You're waiting for a really hot camera to launch it with. The R1 came out and I thought, this is perfect. Man. So, I mean, I'd been reviewing cameras for years before that, but this was the, the review that launched Camera Labs. It's a really unique camera, and the thing that's interesting about it is, is that there's a lot of technology here that if it came out today, you'd still be excited about right, it. Right, for sure. It's 2017, and everyone's getting excited about the Canon PowerShot G1X Mark III because right. it has an APS-C sensor. We'll rewind to 2005, the Sony R1 also had an APS-C sensor. This is a fixed lens compact. Well, it's not exactly <laughs> compact. It's pretty compact. It's a fixed yeah. lens bridge camera with an APS-C sensor. Yeah. Here's something you don't see anymore at all. Watch what happens when I zoom the lens. Look, I can change the speed of the zoom by changing the speed at which my hand turns. Mind blown! <laughs> it's a mechanically linked zoom. The other thing that's important to note, so it's a 10 megapixel sensor, which sounds sure. pathetic now. But it came out at a time when DSLRs oh, had six or eight. Six to eight was the standard, even in pro bodies. Yeah. yeah. And it, in my test, it really did out-resolve them. So you were mm. getting a significant boost in detail. Now, the, the other th interesting thing about the sensor in this camera is not only is it large, it's APS-C. Sure. It was the first APS-C CMOS sensor to allow live view. Absolutely, and that was a huge thing, right? Yeah. I mean, you can select it right on the back here yep. between the finder, the app. Uh, you can do preview where you can see your exposure before you take a, a picture. A live histogram. A live histogram. Zebras. Stuff we take for granted today, but it was absolutely pioneering back then. Nothing else could do this. No. I appreciate your input on this. We're going to go shoot around the streets of New York with this camera and see how it stacks up to today's camera, but thank you very much, Gordon. I Thanks appreciate so much, uh, your words, yeah. You gotta get out of there, buddy. So just trying the manual focus here, and it's it's got the punch in, which is nice. I mean, the res of the EVF being just around roughly, you know, over 200,000 dots, I'm sure it was great for the time, but here's where, yeah, modern technology would certainly give you more clarity. And it is a pretty light, sloppy kind of manual focus, but it works. You know, it's funny to me because in so many ways using the R1, a lot of its features and technology are stuff that we just simply take for granted today. And I'm finding it very comfortable. I forget I'm using a camera that's 12 years old, but there is one way where I remember, oh yeah, this is 2005. And that comes to the memory cards and the RAW files. Now here we've got Sony memory stick. I mean, that's quaint uh, and compact flash. This camera will only go up to six gigs, I believe, but I was able to find a four gig card. I had to look high and low for that, but there it is, camera store brand, by the way. Popping this in here though, the RAW files on this 10 megapixel camera are 20 megabytes. Now that's huge in comparison to today, a, a tradition that Sony still continues to this day. They love their big RAW files, but unfortunately here, it means I can shoot three frames per second for one second, and then it just chugs and slows down. I'm waiting eight to 10 seconds to look at my files again. Even taking single pictures, I gotta wait a good second, second and a half, and that is something I do miss from a modern camera where I can just shoot, look, check it out. I do have to wait here. This shutter, it's just too sensitive. All right, so as you can see, it's getting a little bit darker out here. And first off, I do wanna say the lens is a nice bright aperture. I'm very impressed with the sharpness. ISO performance though, it is kind of tough. I mean, this is a 2005 camera. 800's not bad, but 1600's getting rough and 3200 is brutal by today's standards. And that's causing a few issues because we also don't have any image stabilization or optical stabilization in this lens. So I've got to pay more attention. If I crank my ISO and get faster shutter speeds, my image quality does go way down. And if I go with slow shutter speeds, I've got to be steady as hell or I'm going to get a lot of motion blur. You guys have examples here. so. You know, it's just funny, using camera 12 years ago, this is exactly what I was used to, but I think I've become lazy in my old age. Well, the Sony flash system on here is now defunct, but I guess if you can still find one, I don't mind the position. It certainly gets it away from the lens, gives a bit of directionality. Hey guys, it's Jordan, the video guy, and I have no business being in this video because the DSC-R1 somewhat arbitrarily doesn't have any video recording in it. And that's a huge shame, think about it. If this camera could record video, and Sony said it was very capable of it, this could have been the camera that started the large sensor video revolution. Instead of the 5D Mark II and the D90 getting all the credit, this could be the camera that got the pros shooting, 
with photo equipment, getting a great hybrid photo video experience, and it would have made a lot of sense for it to be Sony that did it first. Alas, that was not the case. All right, so we're here in front of the computer, taking a look at the R1 files. Overall, very pleased. Uh, first off, the color palette's quite realistic. It's matching very well with what we've got here white balance-wise, and I do actually really like the metering. It's doing a great job. For color palette, Sony has always had a very realistic rendition, although back in the day especially, it did tend to overemphasize reds and magentas. I mean, luckily here on the streets of New York, we don't have too many of those colors to really deal with and correct. Uh, as far as the lens goes, though, very impressed at both ends. It's sharp, very, very clear, uh, definitely a winner paired with the R1. When it comes to the ISO performance, what was it that Gordon was saying earlier this afternoon? Much beyond 400 ISO, that noise really began to appear. Oh, yeah, that's what he said. Well, there you go. So overall, Sony R1, fantastic. You know, especially for 2005, I think putting in that new CMOS sensor for the time really made the difference in getting great image quality in this camera. Well, that just about does it for us. But before I go, I do want to thank Mark Weir for letting us borrow the Sony dsc one in the first place. I've had a lot of fun with it. Thanks also to Gordon Lang. He gave us some sage advice and joined us on our little nostalgic trip here in New York City. Check out his book. It's awesome. If you're starting out photography, definitely one that you want to take a look at. You know, as well, I love doing these unsung cameras of yesteryear because normally there's this novelty to using such an old camera and seeing how far we've come and how much things have changed, but this one was a little bit different. You know, when it comes to the R1, what amazed me about this camera is how similar it is to a modern camera of 2017. This really was such an innovative product, and that one has to be appreciated about this camera. A lot of the features that we love today, you can find here. This is the precursor to the modern APS-C mirrorless camera. Hope you guys enjoyed the review as it is. Uh, don't forget, tweet us, Instagram us, check out our channel, please subscribe. Join us for more of these videos coming up soon.